Okay, hi everyone. Thanks for having me today. And uh, yeah, a lot of the talks today have been great. Um, who knew there were that many people still using Thunderbird? I think that's, that's amazing. Uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm here to talk about AI and machine learning and to try to demystify those a little bit for you. And I mean that in two different ways. Obviously, we're all here because of Blender. So one of those ways is a project that I ran over the summer trying to use Blender to actually understand our own machine learning models a bit better. But then the other thing I want to, to demystify is maybe some of the concepts themselves, give you a bit of an understanding about how they work. My name's Andrew, and I'm from 345. We are a software company, and we're reimagining retail. So we make software for uh, lots of different retail applications. So everything from store planning to where products go on the shelves to research projects where people find out what customers are actually going to do. And 3D underpins everything that we do. So we have 3D models across all of our applications and a team of 3D artists that work in Max and Maya and Blender. One of those applications is compliance. So a client might want to know what's actually going on in their store. And so we have a machine learning system that works either on a mobile device, as you see here, or on an image of a full bay. And that system can recognize products. Now, machine learning leads lots of data. And we use synthetic training for, for our machine learning system. And the training system is built in uh, it's a procedural generation system that generates hundreds of random shelf layouts in Blender and renders them using cycles. But we get nice renders like this that look pretty good. And we also get like perfect bounding box data, which is, which is great. There's, I could go on for a whole talk about the pros and cons of synthetic training. But I wanted to talk about a different idea, so I'll leave that to other people. I think there's actually a talk tomorrow by uh, Yuan Miao Miao, uh, so I'm looking forward to that. And so I want to talk about something else. And it all started with this innocent question from my colleague, Matt. And he said that we were going to be going into a store that had these Perspex strips. And he was wondering whether those were likely to actually impact the quality of our machine learning detections. And questions like this can be really hard to answer when, you're, when you've got a system like this. You, you know, the, I won't go into all the details, but you could go out there and capture a bunch of data, retrain your systems, do an A-B test. But it's a lot of work. So I had an idea for how we could potentially come up with an answer a bit quicker. But before that, I want to zoom out and talk a little bit about how image recognition works, or at least our, our version of this, one, one particular system. And uh, a lot of the underpinnings would be the same with other, other similar ML-based systems, too. But before I go on, go on, I am required to warn you that uh, this section does contain audience participation. So pay attention. Um, but that's coming up in a minute. Until then, we've got a bunch of products, and we've got a table. And I want you to imagine that you're doing the job of the machine learning. So you've been given a bunch of products. You know what they are. And what we're going to do is we're going to lay these products out on the table. A bit like if you are doing some IKEA flat pack and you lay out all the screws ahead of time, which is something I learned to do the hard way. And so we're just going to take each one of these and we're going to spread them out. Let's do that. So hopefully that makes sense. You can understand what's going on here. You may not get the exact same table configuration, but you understand the idea that we would spread out these products on the table. And then maybe if someone were to give you a product and you didn't know what it was, you could look around and work out what it was. So what were we really doing here? Well, one way we could describe this a bit more formally would be to look at the distances between the products on the table. And by distance, I really do just mean distance. Like, you could measure it with a ruler. If you wanted to be a bit more technical, you could think about like Pythagoras, you know, difference in x, difference in y squared, all that. Uh, you know, it, the math mathematician might call it the Euclidean distance. But again, just think of it as just distance. So what we're trying to do is maximize, like increase the distance between different images of different products and decrease the distance between images of the same product. Now, the machine learning, the computer is trying to do something very similar, but it doesn't know about tables. So let's get rid of that. What it does understand is points in space. And at this point of the talk, some axes have appeared. This is where people start to look a bit uh, afraid normally. But this is Blender Conference. So uh, you guys, I'm sure, are all fine. I normally start with 2D, but I'm just going to jump straight to 3D. I think you should all be, you should be able to handle that. 
In practice, the machine learning actually uses a space that's more like 256 dimensions, maybe higher, maybe a bit lower. But the distance is the same, the idea of distance between two points, and the concept that we're just trying to maximize the distance of image, between images of different products. We're trying to minimize the distance between images of the same product. That will remain the same. So then what we need is a way to turn an image into a point. And this is really the key to the whole thing. But I also don't want that to sound too complicated, like how could that possibly ever exist? Because you know, a really simple way, a non-machine learning way that you could create a function that takes an image and turns it into a point in 3D space would just be to take the average color of that image in RGB space. And that would give you a point in 3D. So this thing isn't super complicated. That's the, that's the first thing we need. And then the other thing we need is to know where different products lie in that space. So let's just add labels to those ones that we had earlier. And then someone comes along with an image of a product, and we don't know what it is. We put it through that function to give us a point. And then we look at the points nearby to determine what it is. So these are the, these are the two concepts. These are the two components for what we need. And hopefully, it's pretty obvious that if you have a bunch of data where you know what each image is, and you have a function that allows you to turn an image into points, then you know, one way to get the thing on the right is just to put all those images through the, through the thing on the left. So this thing on the left is kind of the key to the whole operation. And this is where the machine learning bit comes in. We put a neural network here. Now, this isn't our idea. This isn't a new idea. This is, I'm basically describing a, a, a process that was debuted in this paper, uh, FaceNet from 2015. But again, the problem when I talk about neural networks is that then sometimes a lot of people, their eyes glaze over and they think, you know, that's just a black box. That's not something that we can understand. And I want you to think, um, actually, uh, Lucas Stockner gave a great talk earlier about denoising in cycles. And he gave a good technical description of, of how a machine learning system works. So if you want to get a bit more technical than me, then you can go and look up the recording for that. But the, I'm going to say that a, a neural network basically needs an objective, and it needs a bunch of data. So the objective is big distances between different and small distances between the same. And then the data is just the images. And as you feed it that data, it tries to meet your objective. And it does that by changing its own internal parameters. If anyone here is old enough to remember tuning an analog radio, you can think of it the same idea, just like tuning into the, the signal. OK, here's that. Uh, Here's that audience participation that I promised you. So I know it's the end of the day, but it's, let's get a bit of energy. I'm going to show you what it's like to train a neural network. I'm going to give you three images. Two of them are going to be the same, and one of them is going to be different. So the one in the middle is either the same as the one on the left, or it's the same as the one on the right. I want you to put your hand up if you think that the image in the middle is the same as the one on the left. And I want you to keep your hand down if you think that it's the same as the one on the right. And you'll notice that uh, participation is mandatory, because those are the only two options. The images will be squared and maybe be a quite a low resolution, uh, which is exactly what the, the neural network is most likely to see. And maybe not the best idea in a crowd full of modelers, but if you want to have a little bonus game, if that's a bit too easy for you, then you can see if you can spot the actual real photo. It might just be really obvious on this huge screen. I'm not sure. But if, you're, if you want to confirm later, you can download the slides off the Blender website. And it's, it's written in there which one it is. OK, so here's the game. So I want to see hands up if you think that the two on the left are the same, and hands down if you think the two on the right are the same. And bear in mind, the machine learning only has like a fraction of a second to do this. So I want to see quick hands. OK, first example, what do we think? Hands up if you think the two on the left are the same. Hands down if you think the two on the right are the same. Good. We're seeing lots of hands up. I don't need to ask anyone why they've got their hand down. That's good. That was quite an easy one. OK, another example. So hands up if you think they're the same, hands down. I saw some hands go up and then down. I saw some hands go up. OK, I'll, I'll help you out. The flavors at the top, salted caramel in the middle, mean bean on the left, and salted caramel on the right. So you know, it is the two on the right. So every, well done, everyone that had their hands down. But this shows a good example of, yes, the image on the left is a bit brighter, but then it also does seem to have a harsh light shining on it. And we generally want the machine learning to be robust to these sorts of things. We don't want it to get too hung up on the exact color of a product, for example. We want it to be able to ignore that if a bright light shining on it. OK, one more example. Hands up if you think they're the same. Hands down if you think they're different. 
Lots of confused faces, some hands going up. Okay, a few hands. Hands are slowly going up. You've, you've, you've had way longer than the ML at this point, but I will, uh, I'll give you a little hint. There we go. You can see that the one on the right is, is actually a bigger can than the one on the left. But once we've squared those images, it's really hard. And you can imagine that if the, if the can had been rotated slightly such that that wasn't visible, then a human like, may find that impossible. Okay, that's the end of the participation. You can all rest easy. <laughs> but okay, what does all this have to do with those screens that I mentioned earlier? So here's my idea. As we know, looking inside a black, the black box is, is complicated. That's why we call it that. And it is. The, you can look at gradients, and you can visualize things like that. But uh, my, with a system like this, I'm thinking, well, you've already got synthetic data on the left. So what if we controlled what we put into this black box and then reasoned about the stuff that came out? And so I did a few experiments like this. So here was me trying to work out what the impact of lighting variations or perspective variations were on products. I can tell you uh, that, as it happened, that generally perspective made more of a difference than, than the lighting uh, in, the actual, in the actual numbers. I'll get to how I did that later. So here's the plan for answering my colleague's question. First thing is I want to add a screen into my synthetic rig. And I am a developer, not a modeler, so go easy on me. This is probably the most complicated thing I've ever modeled. But let's add that in. It'll do the job. And then let's render a whole bunch of images of these products from the same camera angles and with otherwise the same environment settings, but just changing what's in front of the product. So we've got three different categories of obstruction, nothing, the plastic holders, and nothing and plastic holders were both included in the training that we, the training data that we trained our machine learning system on. And then we've got these additional ones of the screens. And of course, setting a whole bunch of renders going still does take time. Like I said earlier, it takes a long time to do these tests. But it's more like something I could render you know, in the evening or overnight and come back to the next day, as opposed to having to go out to a store and capture things, or maybe spin up a whole bunch of cloud machines to do a, a lot of rendering. OK, and this isn't a real hypothesis, but because I haven't told you exactly how we're going to measure things yet. But just broadly speaking, for some notion of whether we expect the, the machine learning to work better or worse, we're ex kind of expecting it to go in this order. So like I mentioned, the holders are included in the training of the model that we're testing. And so we expect those to perform better than the screens. But overall, if it's not obstructed at all, we would expect that to perform the best. And more importantly, and, and this is something I found, again, from experience, that I would really encourage you if you were going to try anything like this. And by the way, I think this sort of process, you could do this even if your machine learning models are trained on real data. It doesn't have to be synthetic right? to, to try testing it in this way, as long as you think you can make good looking images in Blender. And so what I'm saying is I think going in with an objective for like, what should I do given the outcomes that I see, we're trying to decide, should we add the screens into the training or not? Let's come up with some idea that like, if the screens are much worse than the distance between the, the, the nothing and the holders, which we know are actually in the training, then maybe it's worth adding them to the training. So let's take those images, and let's put them through the black box. And now I said they're in 256 dimensional space, but I just wanted to generate this pretty, uh, pretty video. So this is a embedding in 3D. Uh, called t-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding. It's just a clever way of trying to keep points that are close to each other in 256-dimensional space close to each other in the three-dimensional space too. But it doesn't know what class things are, which product things are when it does that. And so each of these little triangles is the three different camera angles of one product, in this case for the unobstructed data set. So we could look at this, and we might be able to get somewhere with it. But we can also look at some actual numbers. So. Just for example, these are not the literal best and worst examples, because there were some outliers. But these are some of the, the best. Low distance is good, so best and worst examples in the unobstructed uh, case and also in the case with the screens. And hey, look, there's our mean bean again. Just a coincidence. OK, so let's take those distances. Now we've got this idea of distances. And I, I, did, mean to, I did mean to say that. A distance of 0.07 is really good. We would never normally expect it to be that close. And they do look extremely similar. Like I'm telling you, they are two different camera angles, but it's hardly, you can hardly tell. And that's partly because of the sort of flat front. 
and a distance of 0.5 would still consider pretty good. These are likely to still be the same product. But as you get up to 0.75, certainly if you went over one, then as just an intuition, then you would think that's pretty low confidence that they're the same. So we can take each of those three points, and we can look at the distance between each of those three points, and look at the average for each product, and then take an average over every product. And we can do this for all the three different obstructions. And there's a whole bunch of other stats we can run. There's a whole bunch of data I didn't show here. But you can see that it pretty much lines up with what we were expecting. The unobstructed data works best, and the screen's slightly worse. But what does that really mean, the difference between 0.19 and 0.28? It's hard to say for sure. So you can also just run some actual prediction tests. So you compare these to some reference, reference vectors, we call them, the idea of like we know what this image should look like and we can try and predict what they're going to be. So that reference set may have you know, 1,300 images in it, uh, different products, I, I, I mean, that the, it's trying to classify against. And again, with, we see this good pattern that we expected, which is that the unobstructed data set is the best and that the screens perform significantly worse. So what do we do with all this information? Well, I guess we should add some screens to our training data then which is what we did. I mean, I've already modeled it, uh, albeit not great. So we created a whole bunch more images, and I felt for this talk it would be good to at least have something to compare back to to see, well, did, did my prediction actually work, or was it just luck, right? Like, did it did a side by side? Did adding the screens actually help? So I generated a bunch more renders with the exact same sort of settings in terms of the environment and everything like that. And the only thing difference between the two was whether the screens were in there or not. So both sets still could choose the holders, and both sets could still choose nothing, but only the new set had the screens. And here's some results of training some neural networks on those two sets of training data. Now, this is only four examples each. It's, it's not the most conclusive data. And the accuracy on the side, there's lots of different ways to measure accuracy, too, so the numbers aren't necessarily comparable. But you can just generally see a slightly better trend on the right-hand side than you can on the left. And that bared out across all the tests that I ran on these two data sets, which is to say that the data with the screens was just performing 1% to 2% better than the data without on these networks, which aren't exactly the same as the, as the other neural network I was using earlier. So that sounds great, right? It sounds like a definite win. I think it would also make sense to go back and check that the actual test that I ran also see some, some differences in the, new, in the new models too, right? So using now a model that was trained using the exact same method as the one that we used to get this data, trained a new data on that new set, of, uh, a new model on that data that we just created with the screens. And the, the results are what we would hope, I suppose, like it, in the sense they did move the right way, but maybe not quite as much as, as, uh, as I thought they would. And I'm just being honest with the numbers. Um, we do see a slight increase in the performance on the screens. And there's a slight decrease in the performance on the unobstructed. But again, to do with how you measure accuracy and different models can just get slightly randomly num random numbers different. So a 1 percentage point drop is not terrible. But to go about four points up is, is good. So I think overall, this was just a win. But I suppose, in summary, it's worth saying that, firstly, yes, this is a great tool in your toolbox, I think, if you're a developer and you're working on machine learning. The fact that you can generate images that just otherwise wouldn't be possible. You can generate images with different variations, change one variable at a time, uh, in a way that you just would be completely impractical or impossible to do with actual cameras. But the thing I was just hinting at at the end of that last slide is that this process of trying to improve your machine learning, uh, often, uh, to be honest, a 1% to 2% increase, you should be happy with that. <laughs> that's, a, that's a win. Very often, you do this whole process, and you don't get any conclusive uh, data at all. You just say, well, that's about the same, or it's worse. So don't expect a magic bullet there. And that's it. Thanks very much. <laughs>